Hi, everyone. Welcome to the November edition of the Reading Research Recap. For this month, I chose a paper on articulatory gestures. So the title of this paper is called Seeing the Mouth, the Importance of Articulatory Gestures During Phonics Training. I loved it because it touched on three really important topics, and those are face masks, the importance of single case research design, and sound walls. First, let's jump into a little bit of background. Actually, very first, if you don't want to watch to the end of this video, the important take home message is that access to articulatory gestures, so seeing them, seeing a teacher produce these articulatory gestures is really important for phonics training. So this is preliminary evidence, but it does also, even though they didn't test sound walls, the use of those cards that we'll talk about in a second, it does suggest that those are important for phonics training. Recently, teachers have been replacing word walls with sound walls. So word walls organize and display words that share a common feature or pattern, maybe the first initial sound as the one shown here, where sound walls display the individual phonemes in the English language, often with an accompanying picture that the mouth makes when they make that sound. But others have pointed out that there's little or no research on sound walls. So what do you do when there's no research? Well, you can look to prior theory and related research. And the authors of this paper show that there's strong theoretical support for the use of articulatory gestures. And there's related research showing that articulatory gestures help with the um, with students' phonological awareness. And so it's not a stretch that these researchers would then think that articulatory gestures could also be used to boost learning for phonics. Yes, there is a lack of research on, directly on the use of sound walls, but this study importantly did not study sound walls directly. So sound walls have a two-dimensional picture of the articulatory gesture. This study had in real time humans, so three-dimensional, or I guess four-dimensional if you count across time, they had the teachers there in front of the students producing the articulatory gesture. And there were two conditions, one with a mask and one without a mask. And across these um, five four-year-olds, they taught different GPCs, which stands for grapheme phoneme correspondences. These are also known as sound spellings or letter sounds. They taught those basic units of phonics to these students and each student served as their own control. So each student got both condition, different sets of GPCs in those conditions, and they measured how accurate and how quickly they were able to learn those and whether they retained them at a later point. So what were the results and what's the take home message? Well, they found that students in the no mask condition perform better. So when they were able to see the articulatory gestures that the teachers were making, they learned those GPCs, graphing phoneme correspondences better. There's a great quote in the paper. So specifically drawing students attention to the articulatory gestures associated with phoneme production could facilitate more rapid GPC, graphing phoneme correspondence, knowledge and skills acquisition. This paper also suggests that face masks could be potentially harmful for early literacy or phonics instruction because you want to have access to that sort of visual articulatory gesture being made. And while, again, it didn't directly study sound walls, it does imply, so preliminary evidence in support of sound walls, perhaps as an instructional tool or reference guide for teachers and students to make the correct articulatory gesture. All right, that's all that I have for November, but stick around if you want to hear me talk a little bit more about single case research design. So I learned a lot about single case research design who, from professors at Vanderbilt who literally wrote the book on um, some of the methods of single case research design. And there are a lot of differences between group research design and single case research design. But one of the key important differences is that in single case research design, you usually have a smaller sample size and you graph all of the data. So all of the um, data points of the outcome of interest, let's say it's learning graphing phoneme correspondences, so accuracy 
on graphing, course, graphing phoneme correspondences, you have all those individual data points across all the individuals in the study. So you know how they did, every single individual. Whereas in group design, you compare two groups, maybe a control group and an experimental group using a summary statistic, such as the mean, you know, the average difference between the two groups. And that's problematic because summary statistics can be skewed. We know averages or means can be skewed by outliers maybe at the top. So maybe an experimental group, you know, a paper says that they did better than the control group, but did every single student in that experimental group do better? Did they have that benefit? Well, you don't really know that from group design studies. And that's what's so powerful about this paper. So this paper is um, from two former Vanderbilt professors that advocates for the use of group design in concert with single case research design. So it's not either or, it's both. And the power of that is that you get to see if every individual gains some benefit from that intervention, or if there were non-responders, and what are the characteristics? Maybe there's a certain subset of non-responders, maybe multilingual learners, or maybe, um, I don't know, some sort of characteristic that defines those non-responders to in the treatment um, experimental group. And I think that this design where you are combining group design with single case research design is so powerful for answering questions that arise all the time in reading research for determining what works for whom and when. Questions such as what percent of decodability should my student use? And teachers and parents know that sort of intrinsically. All students are different. There's so much variation. And there's not going to be one number that works for every single student. You're going to need a different percent decodability probably for all your different students. And the, these types of designs, the combined um, re group design and single case can help answer that. Another question, when do you wean students off of decodable text? Again, I think there's going to be a lot of variation in um, when to do that for different students. And this design can help with that. So this was a very brief overview. Single case research design is really interesting and powerful. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can or direct you to resources. So feel free to email me if you have any questions or want additional information. All right, that is truly everything that I have now for November and I'll see everyone in December.